Let me begin <coughs> by thanking Professor Anthony for her perceptive, probing, and challenging comments on my talk. The time allotted for me is far too little for a response that befits the quality of her comments. I shall address and sequence the two main questions that she raises. Do hagiographic histories, especially when they're highly figurative, hyperbolic, and so forth, do hagiographic histories and biographies ever, ever have a morally valuable function? And did such a history have, and does it continue to have, a morally valuable function in the case of the book of Joshua? About the first, she says that though she has no problem with falsehood per se, she cites fiction. She doubts that pretending that some falsehood about the past is true ever serves a good purpose. So she, I infer that she's against the Santa Claus uh, stories. You betcha. <laughs> the fact is, she says, that false history hurts people. But my view is not that the stories of conquest in the book of Joshua are false. The writer of Joshua was not asserting, speaking literally now, that Joshua slew with the edge of the sword all the inhabitants of all the Canaanite cities, this being a falsehood. Had the first readers of the book been inclined to overlook the superabundance of literary conventions and tropes and take it as literally true, the very next book in the Deuteronomistic series, Judges, would have told them that Joshua was not to be read as literally true history. Judges is perhaps to be read as more or less literally true, but not Joshua. So what was the writer asserting? Assuming that he did not pretend it uh, intended as pure fiction, pure fiction, which I very much doubt. Not at all easy to tell. When a high school basketball player says that his team slaughtered the other team last night, he's not asserting literally now that they slaughtered the other team. What is he asserting? Not easy to tell. That they scored a decisive victory, maybe. But suppose that they just barely eked out a win. Was he then lying? Maybe not. Maybe he was speaking with a wink of the eye hyperbole. High school kids do. But these points about falsehood and pretense are really only side issues. The main issue is whether hagiographic narratives about a person or nation are ever acceptable. Often such narratives are written or told with a moral point in view, and that raises its own independent issues. Now, obviously, lots of hagiographies are horrible. But are they all? But are they all? I interpret Louise as saying that she thinks so, and I've got my doubts. My impression is that most biographies of Susan B. Anthony, of Mahatma Gandhi, of Martin Luther King, and of Bishop Tutu have a distinct hagiographic quality to them, most of them. They are not sober, disinterested scholarly histories. Though let it be added that scholars also sometimes, maybe often, in fact, when you think about it, write hagiographies. These are celebrations of great women and men. Are they to be condemned on that account? I don't, I don't think so, not per se. I think that these narratives did serve, and do still serve, about Susan B. Anthony and Mahatma Gandhi and so forth, an important function in liberation movements. Are they false? There are some falsehoods in them, but overall they're not false. They are selective indeed, but all histories are selective. How could they not be? So I think the question is whether a responsible historian can ever write a biography of someone that he regards as a great person with the aim of showing his or her greatness, playing down, but one would hope not ignoring his or her flaws. Or is there something inherently wrong in that? Not so far as I can see. But what about the book of Joshua? Joshua is an unusually complicated example of the genus of hagiography. I'm inclined to say that our problems lie not so much in its hagiographic character, as in his use of highly militaristic and ritualistic figurative language about the emergence of Yahwism in Canaan. It's this that makes it dangerous literature. It's all too easy to take the language literally. Now suppose that Israel in exile did not take it literally. Suppose they had their judge's book in hand as well. Did reading Joshua make any positive contribution to their religious, moral, and social existence? My guess is that it functioned, 
My guess is that it functioned for them as, a, as I suggested, a blend of admonition and consolation. God would somehow deliver them from oppression. Though since Israel now had no swords with whose edges it could slay people, it would have to be by very different means. Seems to me that those functions of admonition and consolation might have been good things. Though Professor Antony is right to observe that how we answer that question in this particular case depends to some extent, maybe to a considerable extent, on what we make of Israel's chosenness. Suppose that others in other times and places have read Joshua figuratively. Are there any situations in which for those uh, others it made a positive contribution to their religious, moral, and social existence? Did it make a positive contribution to this longing and struggle for liberation of the African-American slaves in the U.S. South when they sang, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho? Having set the stage for dealing with these, the essential questions, I feel Stephanie Lewis, the timekeeper, tugging at my sleeve, saying, time is up. Oh. <laughs> Reforestation has occurred. Um, it's the usual. I'm going to start on this side of the room for a change. Well, good. <coughs> All right. There is a right hand bias. Well, now it's a left hand bias. <laughs> um, uh, Professor Curley, and the mic mic will pass among you as usual, not one of the other mics, but the mic mic. And Wait, then I'm. So you, are you directing me back to the other side now? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I thought you were telling me we were starting over here. I did, but I changed my mind. She changed what was left. <laughs> no, she changed what was left. <laughs> yes, that too. Uh, yeah, that's tough. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm a little confused about Nick's paper here. Uh, on the, uh, on, in this numbering, uh, I don't know what, it's page, uh, you pose a question, uh, those whose occupation is to try to determine the origins of these writings will no doubt suggest the editors had contradictory records, oral traditions, and so forth to work with. This may well be correct. It seems to me almost certainly correct. Uh, and Spinoza discusses this uh, in the Theological Political Treatise, which I'll have a translation to sell in a few years. Uh, the, uh, those who did, edited the final version of these writings into one sequence were not mindless. They could see, as well as you and I can see, the tensions and contradictions surface are real that I have pointed to. So what's going on? Now, I take it your story about hagiographic and down-to-earth histories is supposed to somehow address that question, but I don't see how it does. Um, I mean, because usually, I mean, when we tell hagiographic histories, we usually don't follow them up with a down-to-earth history. Uh, if we want to tell a nice story about how the Puritans came uh, here for religious liberty and so on, we don't follow that up with a story about how uh, they persecuted the Quakers when they got here. Uh, so uh, the, the, the combination of these disparate elements, well, first of all, it seems to me left unexplained by, by your paper. Uh, and uh, and I, I suggest a, a simpler explanation. Uh, at some point, the editor of these manuscripts found himself with <sighs> materials that had been handed down to him, and he could see that they were inconsistent with each other, and he didn't know what to do with that, and he didn't have time to figure it out, and maybe he had a little too much respect for the text to try to manipulate them too much. Uh, so he said, well, I'm just going to pass this stuff on and let my, my people who come after me take what they're after. Um, uh, you, you don't have to address my alternative <laughs> explanation, but I, I, I would like to know how you think your story makes sense. Yeah. The yeah. Well, I would like to start, though, with your alternative explanation. Um, so when Professor Swinburne, he may have left by now. When, 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 he, when he describes, there he still is. When he describes these people as primitive, I, th I guess I know what he means, but I squirm a little bit. Uh, 
So, so I said, they, they were not absent-minded, they were not simple-minded people. They, they, knew, they knew how to write complicated documents and to stitch stories together and so forth. So I've never, I've never been found that at all of plausible. Now, now you're saying, but they ran out of time. Uh, the Babylonians, very plausible to the, me. Babyl the Babylonians were at the gates and they didn't have, but look, I don't think these stories are inconsistent. That's, my view is not that they're inconsistent. Oh, really? No. Jo jo Joshua is this highly metaphorical, highly, highly literary, highly literized, literary, a ritualized story. The book of Joshua isn't claiming, the writer of Joshua, and well, the editors, whoever, the writer of Joshua isn't claiming that, my speaking literally now, Joshua slew all the inhabitants with the edge of the sword of all the Canaanite cities. The book of Joshua itself gives a clue to that's not, that that should not be taken literally both in its highly, I mean, its obvious literary quality, plus the fact that after it says that Joshua had conquered all the cities, the next chapter says that Joshua had not conquered all the cities. So, it's, so it's, it's, it's a highly stylized celebration of Joshua. And, and, and so I say, and what can we actually infer from it as to what happened? Very little. We can make better inferences, in my view, from judges than we can from the book of Joshua. So it's just the question of, well, does it make any sense to tuck together a celebration of a great hero in highly, highly figurative language with a sober history?